Holy fucking shit, this movie is good as hell. Okay, so I know I'm a bit late, and part of that was because I was lazy, but also because there's a lot to take in after watching this movie. Evangelion has always been the gold standard for anime, up there with titles such as Legend of the Galactic Heroes, Cowboy Bebop, Steins Gate, or Full Metal Alchemist if you're fucking crazy. The series is iconic, it has so many classic scenes. <laughs> The opening is a banger. It was on John Oliver. Please carry on and enjoy Neon Genesis Evangelion. Subs not dubs till the day they put you in the ground. Supermarket. Fucking this shit, okay? The anime has sparked thousands of debates amongst its viewers. Some of it is about the theme of the show and what Anno was trying to portray to his audience or to himself, while other discussions are, uh... A bit, a bit more, um, radical. So because of how serious the nature of reviewing and analyzing Evangelion has been throughout its history, I really wanted to get my opinion of the movie right and satisfactory. This is not some shonen series where it's bad guys versus good guys and the good guys win because of friendship or whatever. This is a weird ass show where a boy will beat his meat off to his comatose crush while the fucking apocalypse happens around him. So this movie had some huge expectations to appeal to coming in. I mean the rebuilds were already incredibly divisive amongst the Evangelion community to begin with. You either thought they were cool or they fucking suck dick because it's not end of Evangelion. Thrice Upon a Time was the last chance for Anno to make the rebuild into something that even the elitists would enjoy within the Ava community. And after watching the movie and thinking about it for four months, I can safely say that this movie is not anything like End of Evangelion. Coming fresh off the heels from Evangelion 3.33, and by fresh off the heels I mean 8 fucking years, uh, Thrice Upon a Time is the conclusion to the Evangelion Rebuild series, a sequence of 4 movies that is separate from the timeline of the original series, plus End of Evangelion, plus Death and Rebirth, plus whatever the fuck else they managed to make during that time period. Uh, the rebuilds are generally the same up until the halfway point of 2.0 when they introduce Parachute Girl and, you know, Shinji accidentally triggers the near third impact. Uh, then we go to 3.0 where Shinji has been captured and is hated by everyone for triggering the near third impact and now Nerve has been turned into Vile, a group bent on crushing Gendo and his plans for instrumentality. Plus, Misato is no longer the war motherly figure we want to embrace on our arms while she is passed out half drunk, but now the cold motherly figure we would want to tie us up and place an explosive choker around our neck and call us a bad boy while clearly demonstrating more love to a German 26 year old girl who is trapped in her 14 year old body than our pathetic selves. Uh, why is everyone looking at me like I just said something weird? Cause you're weird, buddy. Shinji escapes Vile though with Rei, who everyone said was dead but really wasn't, and then she like takes him to Gendo's lair where he meets a gay dude, and then they play the piano, and then like Gendo tells Shinji that he and gay dude are gonna go get into a robot and save the world or something. So Shinji's like, hmm, I just nearly wiped out humanity through the third impact, so this is my chance to make things right and make up for all the sins I've committed. But then, uh oh, you piece of shit Shinji, you just tricked fourth impact and then Karu is like this ain't on you kid <coughs> this is what I get for playing nice he takes the fucking explosive choker dies and then stops the fourth impact Asuka gets Shinji as like strap in dickhead we going for a ride that brings us to Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0 thrice upon a time where Shinji Asuka and fake Rei wander the remnants of the fourth impact in search of help Okay, recap over, let's actually talk about the movie from start to finish. Uh, spoiler alerts, obviously. To start things off, let's take a look at the village arc, perhaps my favorite part of the movie and certainly one of my favorite parts of the franchise. So Shinji, Asuka, and Rei are found by Kensuke after wandering the Badlands for a long time and are brought to Village 3, a makeshift village founded by the survivors of the Near Third Impact. Life is tough, immeasurably more so than before the Impact, but everyone here still chooses and tries to live. Oh yeah, uh, you remember Toji and the class president from like 
the original Neon Genesis erection. Uh, yeah, they're now married and have children, which is... Whoa. Kensuke comforts Shinji and tries to lessen the burden on him, that even though, yes, near third impacts killed 99% of all life on Earth, there were still good things that came out of it. Life. That in destruction there is hope, a juxtaposition that keeps life moving. But Shinji is blinded by his guilt. He just sits there like big Yoshi and doesn't do anything. Asuka is the same, but she is still trying to live, and even though she doesn't interact with people at the village, she observes it, protecting it. And Rei, well, Rei just goes full farming simulator and interacts with the villagers to learn more about what it's like being human. The tension hits a peak when Asuka, disgusted at Shinji's lack of a will to live anymore, force feeds him to prevent him from starving himself. This scene looks incredible, and that fluidity and dynamic camera motion truly adds to how grotesque this scene is. It's disturbing, distraught, but that sense of uneasiness is so crucial to the impact of this scene. Shinji needs to live on, but only Asuka is truly willing to force him to live. This idea of not giving up on life, to persist against the cruelty of this world is what Kensuke tells Shinji later on. The angel decontamination pillars are what keeps Village 3 alive, and if they break down one day, everyone dies. But until then, they will live in rebellion of this world that has condemned them to death. And Ray got the original fit back on. Shit. And then we get to Kaji. No, not that one, but little Kaji. Left by his mother Misato to protect him from the shadows through Vile. It is through Ryoji that Shinji learns that Watermelon Kaji sacrificed himself to stop the third impact, and that Misato, despite loving him, let him go. A scar that remains on her mind, a suffering not just limited to Shinji. Everyone is in pain, not just Shinji. Everyone who has survived near third impact has lost something in some way. But unlike Shinji who chose to become big Yoshi and just sit around and slowly die off, they continue to live. And finally, the conclusion to the village arc ends with what I believe to be the most impactful scene in the franchise's history. When the Wunder arrives and Shinji and Asuka are getting ready to dip out this hoe, Rei approaches Shinji and makes one final confession to him. Her true and honest feelings that she had been building throughout her time at Village 3 finally spill out. That she loved Shinji and wished that she could be with the boy she loved. Shortly after confessing though, her body destabilizes and she turns back into LCL. I feel as this is perhaps one of the most impactful scenes in the franchise's history because of how Shinji reacts to this in the movie. Throughout the history of Evangelion, Shinji has certainly not been a stranger to death, alright? Starting with killing Toji in the original series, the death of Rei, killing Karu, the gruesome end to everyone at Nerve, and Asuka getting maimed and end of Evangelion. In the rebuilds, Shinji supposedly kills Asuka again, triggers near impact third, gets Karu killed again, triggering another impact. Okay, Shinji has witnessed a myriad of deaths and has also been responsible for a myriad of deaths. Every time we see Shinji reacting to the death of those close to him or the deaths he caused, it causes him to enter that depressive state we are so familiar with, that state of being inert, unable to find any real reason to continue living. It is something Anno has repeatedly inserted into Evangelion, and in Thrice Upon a Time, Shinji, after watching Rei die right in front of his eyes, while saddened for the first time in the history of the series, moves on and chooses to keep going. This is huge. The true meaning of Evangelion is something that has always been heavily debated and subject to controversy. But one thing most people agree upon from watching Ava is the universal sin that is escapism. The band-aid that is simply running away from your problems instead of trying to fix them. And End of Evangelion taps into the selfishness and destructiveness that escapism poses on the human psyche. But here, Shinji finally breaks free from those chains of escapism and sheltering from his problems that plagued him not only from the earlier rebuilt films but from the original series as well. I'll go more in depth about this later, but for those who complained about Rei dying in Thrice Upon a Time after being fleshed out so thoroughly during the village arc, understand that this was a necessity for Shinji's development and one that I think, while regrettable that Rei had to die, was ultimately what led to one of the most important scenes in Evangelion's history. 
Oh yeah, around this time is also when you get to the fucking title card, you know, which came in, uh, you know, about a whole last one hour and four minutes into the movie. Then, get in the robot and best character in the show decide to start fourth impact and finish what Shinji and Kaoru started. Vile gets word of this and is like, all hands to battle stations, that Star Destroyer is disabled. Before Mari and Asuka launch off in their Avas though, they approach Shinji one more time to get a farewell in, in which Asuka asks a very important question and Shinji responds in confirmation of a very important development in Evangelion. The reason behind Asuka's rage against Shinji was because of Shinji's cowardice towards taking responsibility. She despised his desire to always run away from his problems and leave them with something else. After acknowledging his flaws and weaknesses, Asuka admits another crucial piece of detail, that she probably loved Shinji at one point, and while this is a fucking crazy ass detail, we'll get to this later. Shinji then has a schizophrenic episode, and then we're off to the races with that iconic soundtrack. Fuyutsuki sends out some more random ass ships that came out of nowhere because the lore of the series has never made any goddamn fucking sense unless you're insane. Uh, by the way, this ends up turning into one of the weirdest fucking fight scenes I've ever seen in an anime, okay? This fight sequence looks like if I did speed, cocaine, and black tar heroin all at the same time and tried to watch the scene from Rogue One where the rebels and Imperials fight over Scarif, okay? Then Asuka turns into a fucking angel and like this badass music comes on, you know, Asuka is about to fucking stab the living shit out of Unit 13. Then Unit 13 was like, Haha! You've fallen for my trap! I wanted you to turn into an angel so I could use you to end the world or some shit like that. Alright? And then sucks her in. In, in like a, a, a non-sexual way, and then the fucking ritual starts or some bullshit like that. Gendo boards the wounder, but Ritsuko is like, I fucking hate this guy, he owes me $17. Then shoots the shit out of him, but Gendo is like, I already rejected my humanity, Jojo. They talk, and then right before Gendo dips to enjoy his Fanta Paradise, Shinji confronts him, to which Gendo is like, Cool, bye. The fourth impact has started, and the Wunder can't stop it. They need an Ava to get in there and stop the process. Mari's Ava is fucked up and Asuka is missing, so guess who their hope lies in now? Shinji. And he says he wants to get in the robot. What did he say? You hear me right? Finally, after decades of being clowned on for not getting in the robot, we have finally come full circle. Such a change in heart came after Shinji took the time to notice... Wait, am, am I reading this right? After Shinji took the time to, to notice the smell of the earth in Village 3, something pointed out to him by Kaji in the past. In thinking about Kaji, Shinji wanted to reduce the stress and pain placed on Misato after Kaji died. Uh, you know what? Sure, gr great for him if, if that's what gets him into the robot, I guess. Everyone has problems, something they are suffering from, and you can't expect these problems to leave by running away from them or trying to fight them on your own. You need people around you, and Shinji has realized that, and he wants to be able to do his part in trying to help Misato relieve herself from her burden. But some of the crew members don't approve. I mean, the last few times Shinji got into a robot, he nearly ended the world. They're afraid, refusing to accept that he is their last salvation. Sakura, in her delirium, fires a stray bullet towards Shinji, but Misato steps in the way and takes it. Bleeding out, Misato finally comes to terms with the very thing she has been running away from. That despite all the carnage that Shinji has caused from getting in that robot, had he not piloted Eva Unit 1 14 years ago, humanity would already be lost, and that Shinji had saved them from an otherwise certain extinction. Even if the near third impact was a result of that path that Shinji had taken 14 years ago, Misato wants to trust in Shinji, and tells everyone to trust in him as well. With no other choice, they agree. And before Shinji leaves with Mari, we get to see Misato without her edgy ass get up for the first time since Rebuild 2.0. A return to old form and a return to their old relationship. Shinji enters the fuck ass zone and wow, look, original Rei is still alive and she has long hair now. 
Shinji tells Rei she doesn't have to pilot Unit 1 anymore and takes control of it to fight good old dad. They then have probably one of the dumbest fights I've ever seen, and, and, and you know, this can be subjected to like artist choice or whatever if you want to be really technical, uh, but in my opinion, this shit is just fucking funny to watch. Uh, cue horrifying CGI and Vietnam flashbacks to End of Evangelion. Best character in the show turns into Fanta just like in End of Evangelion, and the Wunde finishes its retrofitting to be able to make a new spear. But unfortunately, someone needs to stay behind and deliver it to Shinji. Masato decides to be the sacrifice, just like Kaji who came before her. And even though she'll never be able to meet her son, she can at least keep her promise to him of always protecting him, even when he isn't aware. She then gets the original fucking cut back in the building, holy shit! This scene was so fucking cool even though it was also sad as shit. Meanwhile, Shinji finally confronts Gendo, and in a surprising twist of fate, Shinji is the more mature one here as he tries to get to understand his father and why he is so obsessed over instrumentality. He sees Gendo's madness, his inability to let go of reality, his delusions over Yui and the suffering it has caused him, and how such suffering and longing for Yui caused him to resort to instrumentality, a lazy but all-encompassing formula to not only relieve himself of the pain of losing Yui, but also to reunite himself with Yui once more. We learned of the similarities that both father and son showed, but also the growth and maturity that the son has experienced, surpassing that of his father. Resistant to change, unable to live alone or ruined after the things important to him were stripped away. Gendo's life reflected that of Shinji's, but while Shinji was able to adapt and understand that his suffering was not alone and the network of people around him that loved him, Gendo spiraled into isolation, obsessed with trying to get the one thing back that gave his life meaning. Gendo then hops off a train because Lamau and Karu is back, and he's like, Alright, so uh, Gendo's having an oppressive episode right now, so let's try and solve everything else for the time being. The first on this list is Asuka, and along with the passing of Rei in the village arc, the next few scenes in this section are perhaps some of the most important in the history of Evangelion. We see that the Asuka we know is a clone as previously mentioned in like 3.33 or some shit, um, and as such, she has no parents to care for her. Her life is lonely and competitive, she only has herself to rely on in order to survive in this cruel world. Her purpose is to pilot the Eva, and thus her reason for living. She believes that is her worth, not just to others, but to herself, and that as long as she can pilot the Eva, she won't need to rely on anyone else or need anyone else's love or affection. But for just once in her life, she wants to be praised, to be told her efforts towards piloting the Eva were for something. She was desperate for validation. Seeing baby Shinji being treated so lovingly by his parents made Asuka lonely, longing for that same kind of affection, and in perhaps one of the coolest scenes ever, Asuka wakes up from this flashback, not in the anti-universe void or in the plug, but on a red beach with a red tide coming into the shore. The setting for the ending scene for the end of Evangelion. Not in her teenage form, but fully grown as an adult. Shinji is sitting next to her on the crimson beach and thanks Asuka for saying she once loved him in the past and how he loved her too, before finally saying goodbye to her one last time. Asuka wakes up in the plug taken by Unit 13 and is launched back into reality. While she's zooming back, Kaoru asks if Shinji would be lonely. To which Shinji replies he's fine because at this point, he can deal with loss. He has come face to face with his demons that had haunted him for the past 26 years. Shinji makes peace with Kaoru and finally reaches Rei. Here, after 26 fucking years, it is finally revealed to the people what the fuck Neon Genesis means in Neon Genesis Evangelion. Congratulations! 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 Go fuck yourself. Like seriously, how did the fucking bitch fuck what the fuck did it take us nearly three decades to figure the meaning of the show's title what the fuck <coughs> uh, uh, anyway uh, here Shinji outlines his plan for the world he wishes not one where he reverts time or the world but one where he rewrites the world into one with zero Avas a new world a neon genesis 
Oh my fucking god! We did it, boys! We finally figured out what the fuck the show's title means. Then, when Shinji finally unleashes his plan, before he can stab himself in the throat to create the new world, his mom intervenes. God damn! And Gendo is also there. They do the sacred tea pose, then kill all the Avas and stop the fourth impact, and the world is returned back to normal. Then, Mari ends up with Shinji, and all the Rei and Asuka shippers fume that their teenager wasn't the one who won the romantic interest battle and was instead the clearly superior MILF who definitely wasn't put into the rebuilds for fan service, you fucking sons of bitch! Shinji is all grown up, he's with Mari, and they live a fucking normal life. God damn, you know what? Cue the fucking Hikaru Utada. <laughs> Okay, now that we're done with the summary, let's get to the actual review of the show. But first, I want to touch on something real quick that I found super nice. Sound design. They have gotten, like, Kanye West or some shit to do the music, cause like, mmm, the music nice as fuck for this movie. Like, they was really in their bag, okay? You know, you got the classics, right? But then you got the new stuff, okay? And then even the newer stuff. Okay, and then you got the crazy stuff. One Last Kiss, by the way, is a fucking baller ass song. Like, this shit was absolutely hitting at the end of the movie. Anyway, back to the review. As I had mentioned at the beginning of the video, this is not End of Evangelion by any means, especially when you compare it by itself and the rebuilds by themselves to the original series. There are so many imperfections and controversial moments in the rebuilds that placing them in the same tier as the originals would be insane. And that is largely the argument for people who dislike the rebuilds, that they pale in comparison and are much too shallow and unrefined in contrast to the originals. And while I agree with that statement, ever since Anno came out, and confirmed that the rebuilds and the originals are part of the same universe, just alternate timelines, this has made it abundantly clear to me that the best way to enjoy the rebuilds is in tandem with the originals. Yes, when you try and analyze this movie by itself, it is weak, it does not come close to the originals, but that's not how you're supposed to analyze and appreciate this movie. This movie is a celebration of Evangelion, of the franchise as a whole. The cameos to end of Evangelion and the original series prove that. This movie movie's impact comes from understanding the franchise as a whole, and only then, when you look at it from that holistic lens, does the movie become mystically beautiful. Many people are upset over the ending of the movie, saying how it doesn't truly fit the Evangelion theme. But don't you think that after 26 years of pain and suffering, Shinji deserves a happy ending for once? I think when you take that into consideration, the lows and overwhelming depression Shinji has faced throughout his existence, the parallels drawn between him and a young Hideaki Anno some two decades ago, who ever since creating Evangelion, his life has only been faced with burdening expectations and death threats. It shows that this Evangelion is much less a meta-commentary on the world like the originals, a vicious scream for help into an unforgiving abyss, but rather a farewell letter to the demons that once drove him into the same corner of despair as Shinji. This is not a perfect movie by any means, but for the first time in this franchise's history, that is perfectly fine. This is not some extremely philosophical, surrealistic, or perfectionist show like End of Evangelion or the original Neon Genesis Evangelion. This is a conclusion, a goodbye to perhaps one of the most profound pieces of media the human psyche has ever conjured. The first time you watch Eva, 
but it's just like, woo, robot fights, and then massive confusion about what the fuck just happened. Your second or third time through should be more like, woo, everyone here is just as fucking depressed as me for similar reasons, holy shit. Most Ava fans agree that perhaps one of the biggest mistakes you can make while watching the show for the first time is thinking that this is a plot-driven series, when in reality, it couldn't be further from the truth. When you sat down and watched Ava for the first time, you were probably drawn to its plot about the robots fighting the angels, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Sele and their nefarious plans, didn't really think too much about the characters and struggles they faced, the lives and backgrounds they came from which formed their tortured psyches, and that's perfectly fine. Hell, that was how I watched Ava for the first time. I just treated it like it was just some random bum ass show, and so when that ending came, I was confused. Mad. I wanted to see the cool robots fighting each other, not some random ass Crayola drawing in a slideshow, okay? But I think that that ending is really what drove me to appreciate Ava. My inability to comprehend the true meaning of the show pushed me to try it one more time and to look beyond the simplicity of robots versus angels and the more cruel and disturbing commentary the series provided on living. That second time around was when I was able to truly capture the beauty of Evangelion. The incredible thing about Evangelion is that regardless of your background, you can find a way to resonate with the show. Such complex feelings are not so easily recognized when we first see them, but over time with more exposure to them, we come to find the characters and scenes we emphasize the most with, and I think the reason why these feelings of empathy and attachment are so powerful is that a majority of Evangelion is incredibly somber and depressing. Our most painful feelings are the ones most difficult to express to others and get off our chests. The stigma surrounding such feelings is crushing and uncomfortable, yet in Evangelion it almost lays bare that emotion in such a way that eliminates the shame, the isolation of our suffering, revealing to us that this pain is not unique and there are so many people out there who are also facing the same things we face. This is one of the themes of the original Ava series and a realization Shinji comes to but obviously is far too late to do anything with that newfound knowledge in End of Evangelion. And I think that Shinji serves as a very important symbol in how this movie should be interpreted both in and out of the screen. As I had mentioned earlier, Shinji's growth throughout this movie not only highlighted his growth in the rebuilds, but throughout the whole franchise. He was always portrayed as the feeble kid, scared of everything, unable to overcome his demons. Seeing him being able to move on from those two paths, seeing him outmature his own father was poetic in a way. I think that while this is a great way to demonstrate how Shinji has grown, it is even more important of the context of the man who Shinji represents, which many to believe to be Anna. To see that broken man, who once was tortured by those demons of his past, be able to make peace with his former self is precious. To see all those things that once haunted Shinji in his past, his inability to take responsibility, his inability to take initiative, and learning to rely on those around him. But I think perhaps the biggest change was the end of Evangelion scene. In the original end of Evangelion, Shinji in his own selfishness is blind to the realization that life is about both the joys and pains of living, and how his own incompetency led him to only be able to save himself and Asuka from the Human Instrumentality Project, a bitter end to perhaps one of the most profound pieces of visual media. Here, the composition of the shot is designed to mimic that of the end of Evangelion, but the depiction of Asuka in her grown-up body symbolizes the maturity of both characters, that the sweet innocence they had as children is long gone, that they are just clinging on to delusions and false promises from the past. But here, Shinji is finally able to say the words that had haunted him for 26 years, that not only was he able to acknowledge that he loved her, but that he also recognizes that due to the circumstances, there's just no way to go back to that love, so he lets go of her. Something that he cannot do back in End of Evangelion. Life is not something that can be lived perfectly. You cannot expect to experience purely joy, nor can you expect to get everything you want. It was something Shinji struggled with in the originals, but here has finally matured enough to realize the cruelty of this world, yet continue to live in it. And finally, after all of that is over, Shinji, or maybe it's more appropriate to say Ano, is seen not just as an adult, but waiting on a trend 
train platform in Anno's hometown in Japan for Mari. We see the other characters living their new lives not as tools, but normal humans. That transition from the train platform to the shot of Anno's hometown in real life is especially powerful, almost as if it is bridging the gap between the events of the show and reality. And that's what it really comes down to with this movie, I think. This is a love letter to anyone who has ever been able to connect with Evangelion, a sign of not giving up. There are so many ways one can find companionship and similarities to Evangelion. Each character has their own struggles that encompass a wide array of needs to which humans often relate to. But not only that, the things in the movie that give Shinji reason to keep living, to fight against the current, reflect a lot of the things in our lives that we can learn from. Mari represents those in our lives who pick us up, who we can depend on to get us through the darkest periods of our lives. Misato represents those who never give up on us, no matter how stacked the odds are against you. And who knows, maybe I'm wrong, maybe that's not how you see these characters, but that's the beauty of Ava. Everyone has their own interpretation of it, their own way of connecting and resonating with the series, and seeing both themselves develop and improve for the better, along with Shinji and Anno through the 26 years that Evangelion has ran is a bittersweet ending to not just a franchise, but something, someone that has been with us through the deepest of lows and the most somber thunderstorms. But much like how Shinji had to say farewell to Asuka, so must we to the Evangelion franchise. Thrice Upon a Time is the end to one of the most prolific anime in history and probably will be revered for decades to come, both the movie and the series. This journey, spanning over 26 years, is one that in and of itself is a growing experience. Evangelion was such an integral part of many people's lives for years that it's hard to believe it is finally going to rest now, being left behind with one's previous self, and all those feelings, frustrations, sympathetic and depressing states that we faced while we were young and watching the show, those two are going to rest along with Evangelion. It is the end of an era.